All right, so let's let's just start off with um, a basic picture. So here, this is what we're gonna we're gonna try to do. Uh, let's say we start with a function function f of x, and we want to find uh, the area under f of x. from a to x equals a to x equals b. Okay, so let's just draw a picture here of what we're talking about. And just to keep it simple, for now I'm just gonna draw it uh, above the x-axis, but I can be below as well. And then let's say here's a, here's b. And so what we're trying to figure out is what is this area right here? Now, um, is that the sh does the shape of that resemble anything that you've found uh, in your uh, in your life? Like, it, does it look like a circle? Does it look like a triangle? Does it look like I mean, I guess it kind of looks like a trapezoid a little bit, but it's curvy, right? So there's no formula to find the area of this shape for a function that I just randomly drew up on the board, right? Um, but we're trying to figure out a way to find the area of this, um, of this function. So um, the idea, anyways, what we, what we do, so this is our strategy that we take, okay? So our strategy, strategy for finding the area. Okay, so what we do, one, we're going to break up uh, the interval, which is from A to B, oh, A to B, what happened, okay, um, into, um, let's say, n sub intervals. And um, so we can say, for example, here, so let's write it, I'll write it down like this. So we can say from x0 to x1, and then from x1 to x2, and then from x3 to x4, and then the last one, x sub n minus 1 to x sub n. Okay, so um, what do those subintervals look like up here on our picture? So basically, if you take, uh, let's see, let's draw this. Um, if you take your interval and you just split it up, so here let's just do, okay, how many subintervals is that? That looks like four, right? Four subintervals. Let's do eight, just to have a little bit more here. Okay. All right. So half the battle is um, not getting lost in the uh, notation just because it's been a while since we've seen uh, this notation but so these right here um, so these x sub 0 x1 x2 x3 um, those represent the different subsections sub intervals so this first x value is x sub 0 then x sub 1 x sub 2 and then I'm going to just put three dots here. The very last one is x sub n. The one before the last one is x sub n minus 1. So do you guys see the match up there with the intervals that I drew down at the very, or that I wrote down at the very bottom and then the purple ones on the picture? Okay, so those are the same thing. Okay, so we break it up. Now, here on the picture I have 8, but, um, but as we'll see, what we want to do is we want to get... Um, we'll, we want to use more and more subintervals, and we'll see why in a minute. But okay, so the first thing we do is we break it up. Okay, two. 
Um, then we approximate uh, the area area under um, F by using N approximating rectangles of width uh, let's see of width delta x so let me draw that on the picture as well let's see how about uh, I'll do this one okay so this delta x here it represents the width of the subsections so that's delta x okay now how do you find delta x well delta x is simply the uh, width of the interval so B minus A is the width of the interval, and, and then <coughs> divided by the number of subsections that you have. So delta X is B minus A over N. So like for example, if the width of the interval was, just hypothetically, let's say the width of the interval was 16, and we had eight uh, subintervals, then what would be the width of each one? and that makes sense right if you're the width of the of the length of the interval is 16 and you break it up into eight sections well each subsection is sub length two right okay so that makes sense hopefully all right um, okay so now here uh, we're going to use rectangles so let's see here how about uh, oh, this blue looks good okay now here um, I don't want to clutter up the picture, but you basically have uh, two options. Um, you have, let's see, um, you can have what's called a left hand approximation where, see how right here, for example, what's the height of this rectangle f of x zero in this case right do you guys see that so notice the the left tip of the rectangle is touching so that's because the height is the value of the function evaluated at x sub zero does that make sense okay now uh, if i draw another one here at x one what's the height of this one f of x sub 1. Okay, good. And then the next one? f of x sub 2, that's right. Okay, now, you keep doing this, right? Uh, and then notice the very last one. What's the height of the very last one right here? Careful. x sub n minus 1, right? Do you guys see that? So notice how for this, so if I add up all those rectangles, the ones that I, uh, the area of all those rectangles, notice that it's roughly the area in the red, right? But notice that I did not evaluate at the very, very last point, right? Do you guys see that? Like I did not evaluate the function at x sub n in this example. If I did, notice I would go outside, right? It would look like that. And now I'm not actually finding the area. I'm going over what I should be. Okay, so I'm not going to do that. All right, so um, this, what I just drew, is called the uh, left, uh, left hand Riemann sum approximation. Okay. This is typically we do, we write it like this, L sub N. And then after this, I'm going to do a new picture for the right, just so that we don't clutter up the whole thing. Um, 
And uh, but so what? It, what would this equal to? Well, what am I doing? I'm adding up all of the the area of all those rectangles, right? So how do you find the area of one rectangle? Yeah, base times height or length times width, right? So notice what's the the base or the width of every single rectangle? It's always delta x, right? For all of them. Okay, and then what's the height of the rectangles? That one's changing, right? But it's f of x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if I write this down, this is equal to uh, delta x times f of x sub 0 plus f of x sub 1 plus dot 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 plus f of x sub What's the very last one? n minus 1, right? n minus 1. And we saw that it was n minus 1 on the picture right here, right? Okay, now, um, why don't we do this? So this is L sub n. So this is L sub n. Um, how would I write this in? Some notation. You guys remember? So let's go. Let's use. Eh, let's use I. So I is going to go from zero up to. Careful. N minus one, right? Zero up to N minus one. What does that correspond to? Well, it goes from zero to N minus one, right? That's what we said. Okay, and then what are we um, adding up? We're adding up the area of every rectangle, right? So right here I should have the area of the ith rectangle. And what is that? Well, that's just base times width or length times width, however you want to think of it. But it's basically f of x sub i times delta x. So notice these two that we wrote down, um, they're the same thing. The only difference is that here I, in the bottom, I factored out the delta x, uh, which if you feel like it, you can uh, factor it out in some form as well. Uh, this is just typically the way that we, uh, that we write it. Okay, now, one thing to notice, so this is kind of, this is the general case, right? Um, but, um, so here, uh, this example was with the one that I drew. Um, I drew eight subsections, right? But notice that I'm I'm off by a little bit, right? I mean, if I if I keep drawing this, you'll see better. The area is not exact. How could you get a better approximation of the area? Use more rectangles, right? So note that the approximation. The approximation. is more accurate the larger n is, right? So that's just a little note there. Okay, so so far so good? All right, so now let's draw another picture. Let's do the right. Let's see what that looks like. So, um, So same same function here. F, uh, we have A, we have B, and then we'll break it up into eight again, just to keep it consistent. And this is still x sub zero, x one, x two, x three, dot dot dot, x sub n minus one. And then x sub n. <laughs> okay, so um, so then the right and Riemann sum approximation. So 
the only difference is that instead of starting at x sub 0, you're going to start at the next one, x sub 1. So if I go up here, and then the rectangle, you're going to go backwards. So it looks like this. So notice, what's the height of the first rectangle? f of x sub 1. The second is f of x sub 2, right? The third is f of x sub 3, right? Well, you can't tell from the picture, but uh, we're using the right tip of the rectangle to evaluate the function. It just happens that they're almost the same in this, in this example, the first point, anyways. But yeah, we're using the right tip this time. So here, the next one right here would be, whoops, f of x sub 4, right? OK, now, in this one, notice, what's the very last one that we evaluate? x sub n, right? OK. Uh, so then, if I'm going to write it down in expanded form, what would be the uh, area? It would be delta x, the same thing, right? The width is still delta x. But then what would I multiply this by? f of x sub 1 plus f of x sub 2 plus all the way to f of x sub n, right? So if I'm going to write it down in closed form, uh, let's see, this would be the sum from i equals what? 1, 2, 1 to n, right, of f of x sub i delta x, right? So notice, what's the only difference between the left and the right hand approximation? The left starts at i equals 0, right? The right starts at i equals 1. Yeah? Wow, that's a good observation, um, but it actually depends on what the function is doing. So in, in both of these examples, most of the function is decreasing, right? So if the function is, notice, so here, let, let's do it on the other sheet. Uh, so just a little note here. Uh, so if the function is uh, decreasing for the most part, like let's say something like this, uh, if you have a left hand approximation, so notice here f is decreasing, right? Then the left hand approximation would be a overestimate of the area, right? What about the uh, r sub n? What would that be? r sub n would be an underestimate. So this is just maybe you can put down notes here, just an observation, I guess, right? Because what would r sub n look like? For the same interval, it would look like this, right? Does that make sense, the difference between the two? And then if you compare, so let's do the other one. Let's say you have an increasing function. Like, let's say it's increasing like that, something like that. Uh, if you do uh, the left hand, it would look like this, right? Let's say something like that. So what is that? That's an underestimate, right? So notice if f is increasing, the left hand approximation is an underestimate, right? And then the if you do the same on the same uh, function, you do a right hand approximation, what would that be? Yeah. Overestimate. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, 
no, it really depends on the function. I mean, it's this one is pretty straight, so uh, it'll be pretty consistent. But usually the functions are curvy and there's stuff going on. So, uh, but um, but okay. So that's but notice all of these are just approximations, right? What we want to do really is, and we said in the very beginning, we're not trying to find an approximation of the area. We want to find the actual area, right? That's what we're looking for. What's the area? Well, um, let's see. Let's go right here. Okay. So what is the actual area? So to find the actual area, well, take a wild guess. If 8 is somewhat accurate and 100 is more accurate, then a thousand is even more, even more accurate. But what's exactly the area? What would you need to do? Infinity. Yeah, infinity. Take the limit, right? So that's the idea is to find the actual area. What do you do? Take the limit. As n goes to infinity of either the right or the left. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we're going to do, when we do it by hand, we're going to use this one. Uh, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, just be, it's a little bit more practical. Um, but um, I'll warn you from now that uh, finding it exactly is typically quite painful. Um, and we're going to have a much better way to find it later. But it's absolutely 100% essential that we understand how to uh, find it the long way. Because every single application of integration um, is based off of this idea right here. This idea of breaking up something into uh, small pieces, taking that approximation, then taking the number of pieces to infinity and that gives you the exact uh, that same exact idea you can apply it not just in area but in all kinds of other uh, stuff and so it's absolutely essential 100% that you're able to do this slicing up business so it's really 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 important yes well it's one of the ways you can use integration to do it. There are many ways to calculate pi. One of them, or to approximate pi. One of them is using integrals. And then there's infinite series, which you also learn in Calc 2. But there are, and then there are other ways. Um, okay, so are we ready? Oh, yes. It is y, yeah. Well, they're actually not very similar um, because one is, I mean, if you kind of, if you, like if I take, uh, let's see here. Well, let's just draw it over. So notice here it's kind of, so if I do the right right here on top of it, it's pretty close right here, right? But already you can see it's kind of, off right so for most of it notice that you know the difference is quite a bit right there but the difference gets smaller as the number of rectangles gets smaller too right so in the purple is r sub n right I guess in this case it's uh, r sub 8 in the picture anyways and then in the blue is l sub n okay so um, alright so then let's let's write it down and then we'll do an example here so um, 
Okay, so definition. Uh, so suppose f is continuous on the interval between a and b. Then um, the area under F on the interval between A and B uh, is given by, and I'm going to introduce some new notation here. Um, let's see, what did I say? Okay. Um, Okay, so we have this elongated S, uh, and then f of x and dx. So the way you, you say this is this is called the um, integral, the integral of f of x. Um, and then I forgot to put uh, a. B. So inter integral, this is called the integral of f of x from x equals a to x equals b. Um, and this for us, at least at the very beginning, so the, when, you, when we see the integral and then you have a to b, right, so that's the, uh, an interval of f of x dx. Um, so at least for right now, um, based on what we've seen so far, this represents the area under f of x from uh, x equals a to x equals b. So that's what immediately you should think. So you see the integral, the elongated s with two numbers one on the bottom, one on the top, of a function, you think, okay, I'm trying to find the area under this function in here uh, from A to B. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now how do I find this? This is equal to, based on what we just said, this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of r sub n. That's what, exactly what we said we were going to do, right? We said we were going to find the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i delta x. Now we said we can do L sub n as well, uh, but, um, but for practical reasons we'll do R sub n. Because uh, most of the sum formulas that we know are start with i equals 1. If it start with i equals 0, then we would have to change it and you know it just makes things annoying. So um, okay so um, does that make sense? Yeah? All right so let's do an example here. So let's say for example uh, let's start off with a with a really easy one. Um, because otherwise, otherwise it gets ugly. Oh, and then I forgot to mention, what's the deal with this? What's the deal with uh, this DX business? What is that guy? Is that a part of the function? No. Uh, so this is called the, the, a differential. So it's the same dx that you find when you get the derivative. You know how you have dy over dx? It's that same dx. But uh, basically what it is, uh, I think probably the easiest way to think about it is what happens as n goes to infinity, what happens to delta x? Where does that go? If the number of rectangles goes to infinity, what happens to the width of every, it goes to zero mm -hmm. exactly. So this dx, this is the infinitesimal, infinitely small. Think of it as the infinitely small delta x. It's that delta x that 
you know, it was two and then it became one and then as n goes to infinity, it's infinitely small. Does that make sense? Okay, so you always absolutely have to have it there. Um, and um, it's a part of the, of the notation. Later on, when you have, you know, when you take calc three, you'll find that there's more dx's and then there's a dy and that's because you have multiple integrals and so um, you you have to do certain things based off of what there what's there for us um, you know you'll always have a dx or a d something and it represents uh, whatever you're integrating with respect to yeah um, much like when we remember when we did implicit differentiation <coughs> and you had you got the derivative of both sides either with respect to y or with respect to x and so whichever one you did, that's the one you're getting the derivative with respect to, right? So it's the same kind of idea. Okay, so if you see an integral without a dx or any, a d something, what does that mean? Something's wrong. Yeah, it's written wrong. Okay. So, um, okay, so we're going to do this using... Uh, I didn't want to do one. Using calculus and using geometry. Now, obviously, using geometry for this example is way easier, uh, but we want to do it both ways just so that we can compare them. Okay? Um, so, this is an example where we don't really need calculus, but. Um, because it's just, a, it's just a line, right? So we should be able to find it, no problem. Okay, so let's draw a picture here. Just We don't need a picture, but let's draw it anyways. Uh, let's see. So 2x plus 1. So we're, we're going to, and we're finding the area from 1 to 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, let's see. So if I plug in 1 here, I get... Well, or when I plug in 4, what do I get? 9, right? 7, 8, 9. Okay, 9. So 4, 9. And then if I plug in 1, I get 3, right? Okay. So the function itself goes like this, right? It's a line. It keeps going. But what this question is asking me to find is it's asking me to find the area between 1 and 4, right? This area right here. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, so can you already tell what it is? I mean, it's pretty easy to tell. Might as well just do B first, no? How do I find the area of that? You can look at it as a rectangle and a triangle, right? That would be pretty easy. What's the rec area of the rectangle? So 4 times 3, which is 12, plus the area of the triangle, which is base, which is 4, right? What's the height? And then divided by 2. So what is that? 24. Okay. So when we find it using calculus, we better get 24, right? We better. All right. Um, okay. So now, how do we how do we do this using uh, calculus? Well, if we go back to our uh, formula here, so this is what we're looking at. So we're trying to find the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i delta x. Okay, so we need a few things. Um, why don't we just write down a list of things here. Uh, we have a, b, delta x. Um, we're going to need x sub i. We're going to need f of x sub i. Okay, so that's all the stuff we need basically. So if we have all those, then we can put it all together and find the limit. Yes? Okay. Uh, so what's A? A is 1. Correct. A is 1. What's B? 4. 
Good. What's delta x? B minus A over N, right? Okay. So what is B minus A? 3 over, what's capital N? Yep. Which we're going to leave in this case as capital N. Why? Because remember, what, what's going to happen with capital N? It's going to go to infinity, right? So we leave it as N because we're going to take the limit as N goes to infinity. Yes? Okay. Now, what is X sub I? Well, uh, we don't have a formula for X sub I yet, but I'm going to give it to you. X sub I is basically take A, which is your starting the where you start the interval, and you're going to add I times delta X. So what does that mean? Well, uh, so let's go back here to our picture here. So if you start here, for example, and you add delta X to that X value, where would you end up? at the next x value, right? If you take x0 and you add 1 delta x, you end up at x1, right? Okay. If you add 2 delta x's, where would you end up? At the at x sub 2, the next x value, right? And then if you add another one and another one, so that's what the, where the formula comes from. This is x0 plus 3 delta x. I guess maybe we should write Instead of x0, maybe a, right? Because that's the notation we use. But basically, it's where you're starting, right? The, the, left, uh, the left end point, and then you just add 1 delta x, 2 delta x, 3 delta x, 4 delta x, just to get to all the different x values. Does that make sense? OK. All right. So um, oh, wait. Uh, there we go. OK. So what is x sub i in this case? Well, we know what a is, right? A is 1 plus, what's I? I is my variable. I is going to change. Remember, I is part of the sum. I is going to go from 1 up to n. So you leave it there. And then what's delta x? 3 over n. Does that make sense? So this is x sub i. That's delta x. Yeah, so notice you want to write them in this order, actually. So notice I wrote a and b first, then delta x, then x sub i, and then f of x sub i. You need, you need a and b to find delta x. You need delta x to find x sub i, and you need x sub i to find f of x sub i. So you want to do it in that, in that order. Okay, so then what's f of x sub i? Well, what's f of x? f of x is 2x plus 1, right? That's my function. I got it from the, that's the problem, right? And so f of x sub i, well, that's just f of 1 plus 3i over n, right? So basically just take that x, right and plug it into your function so what would that be that would be 2 times 1 plus 3 over n i right 2x plus 1 does that make sense does that look right so my function is 2x plus 1 all I did is plug in x sub i which I found in the previous step I just plugged it in to the function right Okay, now uh, you probably want to simplify this a little bit. So this is, if you distribute the 2, it's going to be 2, and then plus that 1 is going to be 3, plus what? Yep, 6i over n or 6 over n, I, like that. Okay, so this is f of x sub i. All right, so any questions so far? We're doing pretty good? Yes, go ahead. So um, why is it true if the derivative is not an integer? Um, what is f of x sub i? So that's f of x sub i. So remember, we have the function, which is this guy, right? 2x plus 1. Oh, OK. So you plug in, plug in 3 into x. Yep. 
Exactly. Yep. So we just plug in the x divided that we found in the previous step. We're just plugging it into that function. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. All right. So now, um, so that's my function, right? So now, um, so. Okay, let's go back here. So this is what I'm what I'm going to find, right? So the area is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of that sum. Do I have everything I need to, to plug into that sum there? I have f of x sub i. I have delta x, right? So then, then, then that then that's it. Okay. Well, let's plug it in. Let's see what we get. Okay. So the uh, integral from one to 4 of 2x plus 1 dx is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n. So up to that point, uh, I haven't done anything, right? I'm just, I just rewrote the formula that I, that I saw on the, on the previous page. And then what comes next is f of x sub i times delta x, right? Okay. Which is why we found f of x sub i uh, and delta x earlier. So what is f of x sub i? 3 plus 6 over n i times delta x, which is 3 over n. Like that, right? Okay. Uh, that doesn't look great, but okay, let's keep going with this. Let's see where it takes us. So we have the limit. This is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n. Of So if I distribute the 3 over n here, what would I get? I would get 9 over n plus... eighteen over n squared I, right? Okay, so so far are we doing okay? Now um, that that doesn't look great but that's just because we maybe don't remember our sum formulas. So uh, let's see. Well, eh, let's, get, let's just copy this over to the next page. Okay, so I'm just going to copy down what we have so far. Uh, what is it? 1, 4, 2x plus 1 dx. The limit as n goes to infinity of the sum. 1 to n. Uh, 9 over n plus, was it 18? Okay, all right. So um, let's do this. So some relevant sum formulas. Formulas. Okay, so these are really important. So uh, let's say you have the sum of, uh, let's say, a sub n plus b sub n. So this is equal to the sum of a sub n plus the sum of b sub n. So basically, if you have, uh, if you're adding inside of a sum, you can break the, those up into uh, individual uh, sums. So that one's probably pretty obvious. And then you can also subtract, so that's fine. Um, now, what about uh, the sum? from i equals 1 to n of a constant c. What is that? So if I have c plus c plus c plus c plus c n times, what is that? c times n, that's exactly right. c times n, right? Or n times c. OK. Um, what about if I have the sum from 1 up to n? Um, if I have a constant, 
and it's multiplying some some sequence some something notice that this constant c is multiplying every single term there so that means that you can factor it out right so that's obvious because that's just the same as when you factor normally right you're all used to factoring stuff okay um, now the one that maybe uh, I'm sure you've seen it at some point but you maybe forgot so what is that the sum of from I equals 1 up to n of i. So that's like adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. You guys remember that? n plus 1. What else? Somebody's got to remember. Example, what's that? If I add up the numbers from one to a hundred, what is it? <laughs> no. Yeah, the story. You guys don't know the story about Gauss when he was he was in like first grade or something. You guys know Gauss? Math, math, yeah, math, math genius. Uh, considered by many to be the best mathematician of all time. Um, not everyone, but many. Um, but the story goes, we don't really know if it's true, but the story goes that he was uh, being annoying in class, so his teacher sent him off to his room, uh, to, um, to the corner, <laughs> not his room, to the corner, and said, okay, we'll add up the numbers from 1 to 100 because he was being annoying. And, um, and so he goes off. So she was thinking it would take him forever, right, because he would probably go off and go 100, 99, 98, and then all the way down to 1, and it would take him forever, right? Um, and he comes back in, like, less than a minute or something like that. And um, so what did he do? What did he do? Okay, so gals, what he did is he did this. So notice if you want to add these, if you write down the sum again, but backwards. What do you notice about the sum of all those? If you add them straight down. 101 plus. 101 plus. How many times are you adding 101? Yeah. 100 times, right? So, well. Well, you're adding, so here you're adding 101 100 times, but then you just added them twice, so then you have to divide it by 2, right? Well, because you're, we're adding them, we added them twice, right? Because we wrote down the same sum again on the bottom, so then you're really adding them twice. Um, so that's why you end up dividing it by two. Um, so, so you end up with 5,050. So that's what he did. That's the story. So anyways, <laughs> uh, this is n times what? So what would this be? The general formula. n times n plus 1 over 2, right? Okay. All right. All right. And then there's another one for i squared and then i cubed, but we'll leave those for another time. Uh, but anyways, so let, let's use these. So this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of... Well, 
Uh, which one should we use first? <coughs> Let's break them up, right? So 9 over n plus the sum 1 to n of 18 over n squared i. Okay. Now which one should we use? Well, the first one's easy. What's the first one? Sum from i equals 1 to n of 9 over n. What is that? Which rule can you use? If I number them 1, 2, 3, and 4, which one would you use there for the first sum? What is it? Three. Yeah, exactly. Take out, well, you can, uh, you can use three, uh, but you don't really have to. I mean, you could use three together. If you use three, you have to use two anyways. Might as well just use two f from the get-go. The thing to realize is that nine over n, as far as the sum is concerned, it is a constant. n is a constant inside of the sum. Does that make sense? Because what is, not, what is the sum from i equals 1 to n of 9 over n? You're doing this. 9 over n plus 9 over n, right? Plus 9 over n. How many times are you doing that? You're doing that? No. You're thinking too far ahead. So what you want to do is only look at the sum. Forget about the limit. You'll deal with the limit in the next step. Uh, because if you think about everything all at once, well, then you'll never get the answer. So you want to uh, think of it one thing at a time. So if you just focus on this sum right here, what is that sum? That's just adding 9 over n plus 9 over n plus 9 over n, over n how many times? n times, right? Right? Because you're adding it from 1 up to n. So it's this. It's 9 over n times n, right? Or n times 9 over n, right? Does that make sense or no? Yes? No? You're with me or without me? Okay. I really don't know why I did that. Okay. So now, um, plus... Uh, this one, it's a good idea to factor out the 18 over n squared. Because then you have, so here we have just 9, right? Plus 18 over n squared. And then what's th that sum? The sum from i equals 1 to n of i. What is that? That's the fourth. Yeah, the, the fourth rule, right? This is n times n plus 1 over 2, right? Does that make sense? OK. Uh, well. What is that equal to? Uh, let's see. So we have 9 plus, let's simplify a little bit. Uh, how about reduce the 18 and the 2 to 9 over 1? Does that sound okay? And then um, you can reduce this n with one of these, right? So what would I have left over then? I would have a 9. What else? 9 times n plus, it depends on whether you're putting, oh, yeah, so let's say if you get rid of the parentheses, it would be plus 9. Or if you want to leave the parentheses, just leave it n plus 1 with the parentheses. I'm going to get rid of the parentheses. Okay, and all that's being divided by what? n. Okay, and I guess since I have the space, I'll do one more simplification step. So this is 9 plus 
n over n plus 9 over n, right? So all I did there was just broke up that fraction into two. And then what do you notice? These n's cancel, right? OK. So now we can take the limit. So what, what's the limit? As n goes to infinity, uh, what is that? That's 0. So what did we end up with? 18. Is that what we found earlier? Yes. No. Oh, my goodness. What do we get? 24? <laughs> well, that's not good. Okay, well, where did we mess up? Uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. We messed up the easy one. <laughs> did you guys see that? That's not a 4. That's a three. Where did you guys get four? That's what I get for listening to you guys. The width of the rectangle is three because it goes from one to four. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, see? Good thing we did it the long way, huh? <laughs> so what is that? That's nine plus... What is that? 12. Well, that's still not right. So what's wrong with that? Well, there's this other one. That's 3, 2. <laughs> wow, we forgot how to add, subtract. So what is that? 9 plus 9, which is 18. <laughs> So now it's right, right? Um, well, so notice how that was pretty bad, right? I mean, if you really, if we go back, I mean, it was fun, you know, because, you know, it's like fun to do math, you know. But um, look at how simple this function was that we started off with. And look at how much work it took us to actually find it. Imagine if you had... Just make it a little bit more difficult. Let's say you have a quadratic. How much more difficult would it be to do all of those steps? It would not be a little bit more difficult. It would be a lot more difficult because you would have all these i squared, so you need a new sum formula. But even that is doable. Um, but what about if you have like a different kind of function? Like... Uh, Well, you can have all kinds of stuff, yeah, whatever. But, um, but what if you have like sine of x? Is there a formula that allows you to add, for example, like this, like that, for example? We can barely evaluate sine of one, two, and three just individually. Imagine adding up infinitely many of them. Uh, <laughs> So this is not really a viable solution for the long term. So the reason why we want to know this is not really because we're going to calculate uh, area under the curve this way. Um, what is really, really important about this is being able to, to understand under, two things. Understand the idea, let's see, this, this idea. The idea of finding something by slicing it up into... A uh, certain number of pieces and then taking that approximation and then uh, turning that approximation into an exact uh, an exact value by taking those pieces making them infinitely small and um, being able to work with all the notation that surrounds that so all that stuff that goes along with it the sums and all that so that is what you'll use because then you take that and you put it together with what we'll see later, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And uh, that's what really allows you to apply calculus in, uh, in real life. You know, so. But that is to be seen. To be seen. So uh, more fun stuff. Any questions? Uh, over what again? Like, uh, we can.
and go over some things. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we're going to continue with the same theme. 